movement, at least among whites, was divided into a kind of button-down, I'm just having this thought, a kind of button-down SRC type of person, a professional person whose job it was to be active in the movement, and who probably was, you know, movement-inclined, and then the Bradens, who on the one hand were not buttoned down, and for whom this was more than a job. This was a life commitment. And again, I don't want to suggest the SRC people were bad people. But this is more professional commitment you felt, I felt, to them. And to the Bradens, this was life. This was their life. There's no difference between the life and the work. It was all one and the same. Louisville, Kentucky. Long known as Gateway to the South, sits at the border of Southern, Northern, and Midwestern currents. A heavily industrial town with some tradition of unionism, in the early years of the post-World War II civil rights movement, it also prided itself on a veneer of Northern liberalism and racial moderation. But an equally powerful tradition of Southern Jim Crow segregation governed its racial laws and practices. Amidst the racial and Cold War tensions that engulfed the country in 1954 at the time of the Brown vs. Board of Education decision, a white couple named Carl and Ann Braden set out to help an African-American family, Andrew and Charlotte Wade, purchase a house in what had previously been an all-white suburb. The consequences of this action would shape the civil rights struggle in Louisville for decades to come. Andrew Wade, Louis Lusky, and Maddie Jones remember the incident vividly. In the community, they had always been known as staunch uh, fighters for civil rights and uh, better conditions for any group of people. So naturally I thought of them as uh, someone who I could rely on to not be afraid since these other people that I had confronted just came out point blank and told me they were afraid. I saw the time, which was a few nights after we had been known to have bought the property, I saw a mob of people uh, go to his house and intimidate him including the builder and the realtor that sold the property and everybody. And um, Carl never uh, faltered one inch. He was very, very determined all the way. So I never had any reason to question their loyalty. But they weren't able to get any uh, anybody to sell to them uh, because they were blind. I mean, he was a war veteran. Uh, but they still couldn't buy any uh, house. And uh, the Bradens, by subterfuge, got them a house in, in Chively, uh, just south of Louisville. Well, the first thing that happened was when they moved in, the man who had sold it to them was, was shocked. And he uh, tried to buy it back, and they wouldn't do it. A cross was burned across the street from the Bradens' house for the house that the Bradens had bought for the Wade. And I guess you know that a, a fiery cross is a, an encouragement to a lynching. Right. Um, and they shot out the windows. And uh, then the house was bombed. I remember when they bombed the Wade's home. And that really created a hysteria in, in, the, in the black community to the point of it was never a point that blacks should be able to live anywhere they wanted to. If they were able to purchase this home from Carl and Ann Brayton, fine, they should have that right. That was never an issue that was prompted. The issue was this white communist family bought this home for some black people to set them up. That was believed in the black community. That's what they heard, that's what the media said, that's what the black community believed. To fully understand what motivated the Bradens to stick their necks out for an African-American family, one has to look at the kind of people Carl and Ann were. Ann recalls her beloved husband, while longtime friends and allies Ira Gruper, Bill Allison, Bob Cunningham, and Tom Moffat reflect on the Bradens. There were a number of people who liked me better than you liked Carl. Now some people liked Carl better than like me because I, you know, because he was more of a fighter and, and he had and he was better organized than I was and really. You know, he was so blustery, and he did so mad at people, and I said he had this real soft heart. He did. See, Carl, Carl was really into helping people as individuals, besides changing the society. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of things that nobody ever knew about, and he, I think he really kind of, he wanted to help people. And, you know, we didn't, never had any money, but he'd give away what we had. If some Carl Braden was gruff. He was a state-your-business-and-be-gone kind of 
Uh, that's not a criticism or a, or, or a comment, it's an observation. He was a, an old line socialist, an old line activist. He was very well developed politically. He had oratorical skills, his, his writing skills were superb. And he was just a, an all around wonderful kind of, of a person. Anne was a little different. She was also a wonderful person. But Anne was a, a little softer. If you needed money for a project, because Skeff always was, didn't have money, you don't go to Carl, you go to Anne. If you could play on this, some of the things, she'll, she'll help you. Doesn't mean that she was a softy, but she was softer. You know, Anne was a, the consummate fighter and organizer. And Carl was too. Anne was a little more articulate and had a little better um, play on words than Carl did. Carl, you would want in a street fight. You know, you'd want him right with you. Anne would talk to anybody. She thought she could win over anybody. Anne had a streak in her that was a perfectionist. She liked to do things right. She was an avid uh, Democrat. I mean, with a small d, believing in in group uh, rather than individual authoritarian action. But when the push came to shove, if the group wasn't doing it right, she had difficulty uh, <laughs> giving in to the majority. <laughs> I began to see how courageous she was, and not only that, how smart she was. She shocked me more, I guess I was pulled to her more because she was white, because she didn't have to do this. She could have been that typical Southern white belle, <laughs> white Southern belle. Deeply opposed to a capitalist economic system that exploited most people for the benefit of the elite at the top, they believed that their own humanity and any hope of changing the country was bound up in the struggle for racial justice. Many other whites did not agree, and the Wades faced harassment and the dynamiting of their house while the Bradens found themselves at the center of a local red scare. They were charged with sedition and faced long prison terms on the theory that the entire incident had been a communist plot they had hatched. That label of communist made the Bradens notorious around the South and pariahs in their hometown. All of this only strengthened their resolve to continue the battle for civil rights, and they immersed themselves in the movement that was bursting out farther south by the late 50s. When a new generation launched sit-ins after 1960 to break down segregation around the South, many of those young people reclaimed the Bradens as mentors and advisors. They were shunned and made pariahs. Both. She was a pariah in this in this city. They were communists, and they were dangerous to black people. Uh, and and stay away from them because you know you would end up being investigated by the FBI, and they were handing out prison uh, sentences, and uh, don't even take any literature from these people. Just stay away from them. They were taboo. Stay away from those people. They were bad people. Those people have never told me to stay away from things that hurt me, so maybe I should, if the things that they tell me to stay away from, maybe those are the things I should grasp. Yeah, there, I was nervous because there had been the history of Carl and Anne that I learned more and more about, and the whole question of them being charged with being communist. Uh, and yet, there was the other side that I could see no wrong of what they were trying to do and trying to accomplish. They, they never, there was never any discussion about um, a revolution or taking over the world or a violent kind of uh, a revolution in this country. They, there was never talk about that by them. Carl and Ann were, fought, were, were about changing, ending segregation, stopping that, and, 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 and get, getting people organized to do that, um, and that made sense to me, and they were and they were very skilled. Carl and Ann Braden never stopped fighting for racial equality. Both of them understood that in order for the movement to realize its full potential, they would have to organize their fellow white people against this oppressive system. Aware that no one is free while others are oppressed, they called on other white people to organize their own, although always with leadership from and in close association with African Americans. Bob Cunningham remembers her resilience, while others who were greatly influenced by Anne, like David Horvath, Shamika Parrish Wright, and Carla Wallace remember their impression of her. I was probably only about, oh, probably only four or five when Anne Braden came to talk with my parents about the work she was doing. She and Carl Braden both came. And I just remember, even as a child, while I didn't understand 
you know, all the theoretical reasons why or knew all the history, what I did uh, really resonate with was that she was so passionate about what she believed in. And what they were talking about is a world in which all people were equal and all people had equal opportunity. Some of my connections with Anne Braden um, as a white person was in, in uh, situations where I, she made me uncomfortable because she, you know, she was pretty, her message was pretty clear and pretty focused, especially her message to white people, and that is, this is our job to organize white people to understand our mutual self-interest. The next day I came in, there was an older white lady there, and this lady had, her glasses were hanging down to here, and she was just plugging away, working on all kind of stuff, and the phones were buzzing and all this stuff, and, that, and I came in, and I introduced myself, and she says, I'm, hi, I'm Ann Braden, and I was just so intrigued by this lady who's a white lady working on anti-racist stuff. I just was like, dang, I gotta help this lady, but really, I was just so impressed by her. I think me seeing Anne, like, if this old white lady can work on anti-racist stuff, like, the least I can do is go. You, you speak, Bob, and by the, in doing that, I met Anne Braden. And the rest is history, I guess, because she would call me sometime at midnight. What are you doing, Bob? I'm trying to sleep, Anne. Well, look, there's going to be a demonstration. There's going to be a meeting, so-and-so, and Bob, you should be there. And before I know it, I was, I guess, thrown <laughs> into the struggle without the stepping into it. I was pulled into it, you know. I hate to say, it, it may not sound right to say that I was pulled toward Ann more because she was white, but I think I was. Because I knew that, you know, we as black folk and people who are oppressed had to do something, but she did not have to. She could have been comfortable. The Bradens left a lasting legacy, not only on Louisville, but on the South and the nation. Although Carl died in 1975, Anne continued their brand of ceaseless organizing against the divisions of racism until her own death in 2006. She took her message of the centrality of the fight against white supremacy to every subsequent justice struggle of the 20th century. In doing so, she became an inspiration for several younger generations across racial lines who see it as their job to fight for racial equality. You know, Ann and Carl really, when they bought that home for the uh, Wade family, and uh, what they set off by doing that has affected the lives of millions of uh, people in this country and around the world. Hundreds of young white people uh, and middle-aged and older white people think of that example and knowing that, that that was clearly the right thing to do. Um, and uh, they are just, uh, by their actions, a beacon of hope in the country. Every time I feel like that I'm going to quieten down and get out of the struggle, she appears. She shows up, still. <laughs> so uh, I think it was one of the best things that ever happened to me is to have met Anne. Let me follow through with Anne just a little bit. She is no doubt one of the two or three most significant people that I've ever had the privilege of working with. She just had a, a, a major impact on this country uh, far beyond Louisville. And she used to say that to, to me. She said, Shamika, no matter how much work I do against racism, I'm still a white woman doing this work. So I still have that white lens. Even though I'm working to fight it, it's still my lens. And, and, and I believe that was true. I think that that's what made her significant and made a lot of people um, get drawn in is because she helped folks to understand we need to be help. we need to help lead this work. We need to help our people. She wasn't doing it for black people. She was doing it because she saw something wrong with her people. And that's what I was admired about her is she turned away from her privilege. She could have went in so many different directions, but the direction of I'm going to stay here, I'm going to be a part of this work, I'm going to help in. I'm going to help deal with race, you know what I mean? Ann Braden used to say, uh, we can't believe that we're the only special ones who can be part of change. We have to believe there are other people out there.